We've been doing a series this month on thankful. Everybody say thankful. You know, the scripture said, in all things give thanks. He didn't say thank him for all things. And there's a huge difference. You know, there are things that happen in our life that what God's asking us to do is learn how that no matter what happens is to give him thanks. And I, this time of year, especially as we begin to prepare for a Thanksgiving meal, I wonder if sometimes we really remember or understand out and why we're doing it. We're obviously thankful for God, and you know, when I was doing missionary work, I kind of got thrown on this Thanksgiving thing because I was in Trinidad, and I, it was May, and they said, oh, we're going to a Thanksgiving dinner, and I thought, we're doing what? We're, you know, you missed it. That's November. But what they did, which was really unique to me, is when they gathered together, they threw Thanksgiving dinners throughout the year, and it was over things that they were thankful for. So if it were a new house or a new job or just, you know, God had done something for them, they would do a Thanksgiving celebration and invite all their family and friends in. So how many of you have something to be thankful for? Wave your hand. All right, I'll be at your house later for, for dinner. <laughs> no, we, everybody say thankful. So today, in, in keeping with that series today, I want to talk to you about thankful for the journey. And I'd like to remind you about how this nation really came about. You know, once upon a time, there was someone that made a statement and said, this is not a Christian nation. I'm going to prove once and for all that that statement is not true. We are a Christian nation. Amen. So when... Back in the 1500s, if you would just stay with me here for a little bit. Back in the 1500s, England passed a law. And in that law, if you did not come to the Church of England on Sunday, you got fined for every Sunday you missed. You had to pay a penalty. So I want you to think back of the Sundays you've missed and calculate accordingly. <laughs> but you had, to, you had to pay a penalty for that and and god forbid that you should dare have a church service apart from the church of england because if you did that you went to prison this is how a group came about that became referred to in history as separatists they didn't believe that government ought to control how they worship god they they, they ought to have the right and the freedom to worship God as they saw fit. And they, they suffered. Uh, the, many of them were imprisoned and paid fines. And finally, they got together. And so they called them separatists because they had separated from the Church of England. And they, they went to the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, they found a place where they could worship God freely. Unfortunately, the Netherlands culture had such a bad influence on their children and their families. They saw their children start to dramatically change and the culture around them influencing them not for the good. Any parents ever been concerned about that, about your, your children not being influenced for the good? And so what they decided to do was go to the new world. So as they made plans, they left the Netherlands on a ship called the Speedwell in the end of July in 1620. The plan was they were supposed to sail to Southampton, England, and meet up with the Mayflower and then go on to the New World. So when they got to Southampton after they set sail, the Speedwell started leaking like a sieve. And they found themselves having only sailed 75 miles and pulling into port to try and make the repairs. Now passengers were starting to get nervous because they, you know, they're already experiencing some trouble. I want to say something to you, and I want you to get this. If you think you're going to live your life with no trouble, it's just not going to happen. Trouble and disappointment is a part of life. 
The difference is what you do with it. Because we all experience it, but if you can learn how to take that to God, then you're going to find out that God can sustain you in the midst of trouble and adversity. They start the repairs. Some of the folks already, you know, they, they, they decide, man, I'm not going, you know, this, this can't be right. You know, how many of you have ever heard that statement that, man, if, you know, if this were God, then I wouldn't, then I wouldn't be going through anything. If, I mean, if, 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 if God loved me, then I wouldn't be facing anything. Well, that's, that's not true. Matter of fact, let me explain that to you. It said, for God so loved you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's how much God loves us. And these people abandoned the trip. They ended the journey right there, and they, were, they, they just weren't thankful for it. They decided, I'm, I'm going to leave. And so in the midst of doing that, others, you know, they, they took off. Now it's August 17th. They sail, go another 200 miles, and I'll be if the speedwell doesn't start taking on water again. And this time, there's nothing they can do but abandon the ship. So they have to, some of the people have to go back and others go on. The, those that went back planned to come the next year. So they crowd 102 passengers into the Mayflower. 50 of those people are separatists. Others are adventurers. They're people that are looking to turn a dollar, you know, and, and they're, they're sailing together, but they're all in the same ship. Let that sink in a minute. <laughs> you understand? We're all in the same boat. The only difference is who our captain is. <laughs> so I, I want to make sure that, I, matter of fact, oh, man, I could tell a story right now. I think I will. Is it okay? I know I've told it before, but when you get old, you're allowed to do that. So what... There's this, see, who, who, who your captain is can make all the difference in the world. There's a boy, and he's standing on the banks of the Mississippi River. And as he's standing on the banks of the Mississippi River, he's, he's waving at this big steamship out in the middle of the water, and he starts jumping up and down yelling, I want to ride, I want to ride. The old gentleman that was standing there fishing looked over at him and said, Son, he said, why don't you just be quiet? That ship can't hear you. He looked at the old man and he started jumping higher and yelling louder, I want to ride! I want to ride! The gentleman stepped over to the young boy and he said, Son, he said, do you know what ship that is? He said, that's the River Queen. A ship as important as that ship is doesn't have time for a little boy like you. He looked at the old man, turned around, looked back out in the river, Looked back at the old man, jumped up higher and yelled, I want to ride! I want to ride! <laughs> and to the old man's amazement, the ship turned, started toward shore, let out a gangplank, and that little boy scurried up that ship, and it turned back into the mouth of the river and started back down the river, and the man is standing on the bank with his mouth dropped open and his eyes wide, and all of a sudden the little boy leaned up over the rail and he hollered back. He said, I knew he'd come. My daddy's the captain. <laughs> Do you understand that wherever you find yourself, all you've got to do is call out, and he's there. He's going to come for you. He doesn't leave you or forsake you, but he goes with you to the end of the world. Meanwhile, back at the Mayflower. <laughs> so now they're, they're, they're piled in, 102, 50 separatists, and the journey is unrelenting. These waves are tossing that ship around. I want you to fathom being on the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean, I don't know if you, under, if you know this, but the Atlantic is adversity, and the Pacific is peace. Why do they say that? Because the Pacific Ocean is much more peaceful than the Atlantic. The Atlantic's waters are very turbulent, and they're sailing across that, and in the middle of that journey, a beam cracked, and they thought, man, we're, we're done now. You know, this, we're, we've, we've taken on an injury to the ship. We're not going to be able to make it, but those separatists had brought a corkscrew with them, and they put that corkscrew up on that beam and tightened it down and held it together. 
And so the journey continued. They would lose one man's life on that ship, but a child would be born on that ship. And after so much sickness and so much turbulence and so much distress and so much water, they were starting to run low on food supplies, and they thought, man, we have got to find land. After a 3,000-mile journey, 65 days on an open sea, on Thursday, November 9th, 1620, they, the Mayflower spotted land, and it was Cape Cod. But the journey was far from over. Within the next four months, 51 of the 102 passengers would be all that survived. Pneumonia and scurvy claimed their lives. And after that winter, a man by the name of William Bradford that had been the governor of that, and would end up becoming the governor of that colony for 30 years, after that first trying winter, he wrote these words. What could now sustain them but the Spirit of God and His grace? May not and ought not the children of these fathers rightly say, Our fathers were Englishmen which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in the wilderness, but they cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard their voice and looked on their adversity. I promise you today that God hears your cry. And so you can be thankful for the journey. I thought about this. I thought about all they'd been through, all that they had gone through. The next spring, they had the opportunity to leave. They could have gotten on the ship and sailed back and said, forget this, man. There's been too much pain on this journey. There's been too much turmoil here. There's been too much that I've gone through. I, 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 I wasn't expecting all this. They could have left, but they didn't. Instead, they stayed. Why? Because they remembered why they had come. They didn't come because they thought everything was going to be sunshine and roses. They came because they were hungry for a a place that they could worship God and love him openly and freely. As a matter of fact, when they landed, they missed the point where they were supposed to land, so they had no charter for that place. They, they sat together on the Mayflower, and before they set foot on land, those men, the separatists along with adventurers, sat down and comprised the Mayflower document. It was called the Mayflower Compact. These are the first lines in that compact. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. What were they saying? They said, that's why I'm here, for the glory of God and to let everybody know that Jesus is alive and well. What, can I ask you a question? Why are you here? You know, why, why are we here? I didn't know why I was here for a long time until I met him. And after I met him, I've stayed true and thankful for the journey. Everybody say, I'm thankful for the journey. Now, I need you to understand that they're not the first ones to ever be thankful for a journey. As a matter of fact, years before they were ever thought of, there is a man that's very religious there's a difference between religion and relationship. A man that's very religious, and here's his story. It's found in the book of Acts chapter 9. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any in this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And this is where everything changes. And as he journeyed, everybody say, thankful for the journey. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. I hope you don't read that too fast. I want you to get what's going on. 
Saul is an angry man. He's a guy that's creating havoc everywhere he goes. He's committing people to prison. Why? Because they're worshiping this Jesus. And man, he is dead set to stop them. And on his way to Damascus to get letters to bind up Christians, believers like you and I, he's going to throw them in prison, show them no mercy. And on the way there, on his journey, a light shines. A voice is heard out of that light. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Isn't it amazing that the voice didn't say, Saul, I'm going to take your head off. Isn't it amazing that the voice didn't say, Saul, I'm getting ready to put the hammer on you, buddy. You've been messing with me long enough. No, it doesn't. It didn't come to destroy him. It came to rescue him. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And here's where it really gets interesting to me. You've got to put yourself there. Don't, don't just read this. Put yourself there. Let you, you Put your feet in Saul's shoes for a moment. Saul makes a statement. He said, who are you? You ready? <laughs> I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Now, I know that it doesn't say this in Scripture, but let me tell you, if I'd been in Saul's shoes, I'd have been going, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you, you, you're who? You, you, you're Jesus? How many of you have ever found yourself in a situation in your life that you found out what you've been fighting so hard is what you needed all along? Oh, don't anybody get excited in here today. You know what I'm talking about? All of a sudden, you find out that the thing you pushed against and you kept pushing back was the very one that loved you enough to stop you, turn you around, and say, you know what? It's a brand new day. I'm going to take away your sorrow. I'm going to take away your anger. I'm going to take away your heartbreak and your heartache, and I'm going to give you a new life in him. That's what he does. I'm thankful for the journey. I'm thankful that there's a God that reaches his hand out and rescues us when we're going the wrong way. Any of you in here ever been going the wrong way? We don't like to be wrong about anything, do we? Especially guys. You, listen to me. You guys know what I'm talking about. Have you, have you ever had to tell your wife, your hangs up right here, man. I found a way around that. I look at her and said, you know what? You was right. <laughs> yeah. She's saying, you saying you were wrong? No, I didn't say that. I said, you were right. <laughs> we find, we, but the truth is, is Paul had to acknowledge, and, and remember that Saul now becomes Paul. Paul had to acknowledge he'd been wrong. But aren't you thankful for the day that you found out you were wrong so you could get it right? Aren't you glad that somebody stopped? Man, I remember I was in, I, I was in a, on a mission trip in Honduras, and there had been a flood there, and I'm going down the road. I'd run at this truck. I'm driving down the road at night, and all of a sudden, man, I, the, we, we're in this truck. We have to lock the brakes up. Man, I'm going forward. I'm thinking, what in the world's going on? Bridge out. No sign, <laughs> no light, no flashing, nothing. Didn't even see it until the headlights lit up, bridge out. What? <laughs> bridge out. Man, thank God that he sent the flashers before we went off the bridge. Somebody give him a hand clap of praise in here today. <laughs> You need to understand, it wasn't like that Paul's life after he met Christ was all sugar and spice and everything nice. Paul went through some stuff. Matter of fact, Ananias didn't even want to go pray for him. Ananias is the prophet that the Lord spoke to and said, I want you to go pray for Saul. And, and he, he's, he's blind right now. I want you to go pray for him. I'm going to heal him. And then you, you, know, you pray for him. Ananias said, can I put it in plain English? Ananias is going, do what? This guy has been throwing us in prison. If he's blind, he can't find us. <laughs> I mean, I'm just talking about, you know, I'm trying to put myself there. And, you know, if, 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 I mean, you know, are you sure you want to do this, Lord? Listen to what the Lord said to Ananias. He said, Ananias... He said, you go pray for him. 
because, because he's a chosen vessel. And I've shown him how many things he's going to have to suffer. And Paul, knowing that he would go through that, never turned around, never gave up the journey. As a matter of fact, in the book of 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, Paul talks a little bit about what he went through. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I've been shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea, I've traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and robbers. I have faced dangers from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced dangers in the cities and in the deserts and on the seas. I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. Everybody say, danger, danger, danger. Everywhere he went, man, he was in trouble. He said, I have been hungry and thirsty, and I have often gone without food. I've worked hard and long and during many sleepless nights. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm, but I never turned back. I never gave up. I I never quit. I just kept saying, thank you for the journey. Thank you that one day you rescued me. Thank you that you found me, that you turned me around. And yeah, I may be going through some stuff here, but this ain't the end of the road. I'm looking for another day, another life, another time. And if I'm true here, I'm going to rejoice with joy unspeakable there. Everybody say the journey. Now, Paul writes encouraging others. You'd think after all he'd been through. I mean, look, some of us have probably been stoned, but not because we were serving God. Figure it out. I've, I've taken some tongue lashings. But I've never had anybody tie my hands to a post and rip my back open 39 times. And that happened to him three times. I'm telling you, man, what I'm talking about is so real that it'll give you strength you didn't know you had. You'll find him in ways you never experienced him before. Paul didn't know he could go through that before he faced it. It was he found grace in the midst of the need. Aren't you glad that he does the same for us? Now, Paul begins to write to other believers, and he's, listen to what he writes to them. Whatever happens... Boy, it got quiet. Everybody say, whatever happens. Have you ever heard, well, yeah, I'll I'll go with you as long as this don't happen. (laughs) I'm with you all the way. But if you do this, it's over. Paul writes, whatever happens, because some stuff had happened to him. He writes, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Are you kidding me? I had a deer run right into my car. I wasn't even bothering it. I wasn't hunting. He ran right into my car. And get this now. You know where I'd been? This has been years ago. You know where I'd been? I'd been here preaching a message for you all. Well, I was an evangelist, and you guys let a deer run into the side of my car. Isn't it amazing how all of a sudden we, the blame just starts getting spread? I can't believe it. God, I can't believe you let that deer run in. I'm preaching your word, and there that deer come, pal. And I didn't even get to keep it. It ran off. Rejoice. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That deer just smashed my car. No, that's not, that's not what he means. Rejoice. In all things, give thanks. Thank you, God, that that deer didn't come through my windshield. 
thankful for the journey. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things. You ever like to tell people stuff? You ever been tempted to tell somebody, I told you so? Paul says, I never get tired of telling these things. He said, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for dogs. In the King James Version, it says, beware of dogs, in case you ever wondered where the sign came from. (laughs) Beware of dogs. But these dogs are two-legged. Watch what he says. He says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do, do evil, those mutilators who say, let me say that word again. I put an R in there where it wasn't one. Those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying when anybody tries to associate your salvation with anything else other than what he did for you at Calvary's cross, stay away from them. Beware of them. Watch out for those dogs. Otherwise, you're taking away from what he accomplished and what he did. Oh, but I did this. to get No, you didn't do anything to get saved. All you did was accept a gift that had been given to you. So hear me. You're not. People say, well, you don't understand. I'm too bad for God to save me. You ain't too bad. You ain't. You aren't too bad for God to save you. I forget. I'm a public speaker. I have to say these things right. You, you aren't too bad for God to save you. And you're not so good that you don't need saved. Amen. We all need him. We all need him. So he says, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have a reason for confidence in their efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised on when I was eight days old. You say, well, what's that mean? According to Jewish law, the child was supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day. Paul is saying, I did it on the very day that the law required it. He says, listen to what else he tells him here. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if ever there was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, and as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Now, here's where the journey changed for him. In verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Not as though I'd already attained or already perfect, but I follow after. Do you know what that little phrase means? I follow after. It's not some stroll in the park. It's not some leisurely walk in the morning. It means to be in hot pursuit of. Paul's saying, I'm trying to apprehend why I was apprehended. There's a God that I wouldn't even look into that reached into my world and changed my journey. And ever since, since that day, I've been trying to find out why. <laughs> why would you love me that much? Why would you care that much that you would rescue me? This isn't a guy that's a good guy. This guy's been responsible for the deaths of people that love Jesus. And don't you know how that haunted him? He made a statement one time. He said, I'm the least worthy to be called an apostle. He was there and consented to the death of Stephen. And the Bible said that when when they stoned Stephen, his face was glowing like an angel. Paul had seen that. And I think deep down in his heart, he always knew. But sometimes we get so entrenched in a lifestyle that it's so hard for us to let go of it. That's why when the voice spoke to him, it said, I'm Jesus, 
whom you're persecuting, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Can I put that in plain English? Paul, you've known this all along in your heart. And now that you've come face to face with me, it's ripping you apart on the inside. But I didn't come here to destroy you, Paul. I came to rescue you. I came to set you free. Somebody shout yes. <laughs> Thankful for the journey. Paul did not give up despite all his hardships. And there were so many of them. Matter of fact, in the book of Acts, you know, after Paul had this journey changed, this, in, in the book of Acts, if you read that, you find out that he tells about it everywhere he goes. How many of you have ever had some hard places in your journey? Anybody? We went on the road. I remember going on the road full time, and I was so thrilled. We had a Frito-Lay truck. Supposed to be a motorhome, but it looked just like a Frito Lay truck. And, and it was, man, I was excited. Nothing worked inside of it, but I was excited. Had a big old refrigerator, it didn't work. We had a, a big air conditioning system, heat, central heat, it didn't work. Matter of fact, I remember we were on our way up to Rogers, Arkansas in January to preach a revival. The kids and Debbie had turned the seat, you know, those seats, you know, that there's a table in between. It's called a kitchen net thing. And, and you could flip this seat either way. You could flip it and look out the window like you're going down the road, or you could flip it and be by the table. They had flipped it over where they would be by the dash, and then they crawled underneath the dash with a blanket to stay warm. I've got on a parka. You remember those big parkas? I had a parka on zipped all the way up. I had one hand shoved in my pocket and driving with the other hand. And every five minutes I'd switch hands to get that one warm. I was praising God, man. Are you out of your mind? I guess I must have been. I was just excited uh, that my journey had changed. Uh, I was so thrilled to know uh, that God had turned my life around. I wasn't raised in folks' church. I didn't know anything about God. Uh, so when it happened for me, uh, it was an encounter. Uh, it was something that touched me, and I couldn't explain them away. Oh, I could kind of explain away everybody hopping around. I'm like, man, you know, they got problems. You know, they got in a nervous condition. But when they, when all of a sudden the presence of God hit me, uh, touched me, uh, there was no dismissing that. Uh, there was no letting go of that. Instead, I embraced it, uh, and I've been hanging on to it ever since. <laughs> Thankful for the journey. Paul makes a statement, and he tells him, he said, look. He said, the, he, he's at this place, and these people... There, there's been a word of prophecy that came that told Paul he was going to be put in chains and in prison if he go, went to Jerusalem. And they're begging him not to go. And Paul looked at him. He said, why are you trying to break my heart? He said, I'm not only ready to be bound for this gospel. I'm ready to give my life for it. Because he remembered where he'd come from and how merciful God had been to him. And he looked at him and he said, this is what I know. He said, I know that chains await me in Jerusalem. Listen to what he says. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Why? That I might finish my course with joy. Everybody smile at me one time. Come on, if you're not smiling, you didn't brush your teeth or you left them at home. <laughs> smile. Say, so how can... I smile because he loves us. How can I smile through my pain because he's there? How can you smile because I know I'm not alone? Whatever happens, rejoice in the Lord. I'm not thanking God for what happened. I'm thanking God that he was there when it happened. I'm thanking him that he's an ever-present help in a time of need. I'm thanking him because I know that the best is still yet to come. Somebody shout, yes, thankful for the journey. So this is why I want you to stand with me now. I hope that when you get ready to sit down and you're thanking God for the turkey, 
that you thank him for everything else. Thank him that you were able to put a turkey on that table. Pastor, you don't understand, man. This Thanksgiving dinner is costing so much more than it used to. Be thankful that he still provides. Thankful. In everything, give thanks. Thankful for the journey. This is what I want to do this morning. I'm not going to hold you long, but I want to take time for this. We're going to have encounter tonight. You know, encounter night is when you come out and, you know, leave your bobby pens at home. If you're here today and you're somewhere along that journey and it's tough now, I want you to come and we're going to do something together. We're going to thank God for the journey. I'm not thanking him because of what I've gone through. I'm thanking him because he was there and helped me through. So I want to take a moment right now, and if you're here, I know there's some of you in here that have had a fall. If you're here, I want you to come right now. If you're here and you're struggling over your financial situation, I want you to come right now. If you're here and you've suffered heartache and heartbreak, I want you to come right now. Because there's a God that has promised, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you in your darkest moments. I'll cause the light of my love to shine in your world and give you a reason to smile again, give you a reason to hope again, give you a reason to rejoice again. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Would you just stretch your hands to heaven with me right now, ushers, if you would. Look, there are some of you here today, and you're not up here, and that's okay. But I just want you to understand if even, if, if you'll just from where you are, if you'll just slip your hand to him. Say, Pat, Rick, what's this about? Why, why do you do this stuff here? Well, if you ever look up the word praise in Greek, it means an extension of the forearms. Do you ever wonder why trees, branches go like this and not like this? It's because they're praising the one that created them. <laughs> it was odd. I didn't know anything about him. And when I felt him, my hands started reaching for him. If you'll do that now, wherever you're at, I promise you're going to find him there. Just stretch your hands to heaven with me right now. He's a good God. Thank you, Father. Hold her in your arms. Strengthen God as only you can. I ask it in your name, and I give you praise for it now. Say, Pastor, what's going on? Look, the Scripture said that no man can see God and live. When God touches you, something is going to happen. You might cry. You might laugh. You may fall in his presence. But if the God that spoke this world into existence and cast the stars into space with his hand, if that hand touches you, you're going to feel it. Stretch your hands to heaven with me right now. Sometimes we reach a point in our walk or in our journey 
and we feel like it's come to an end. This is a roadblock, but we don't realize that God is getting ready to do something new. And even though we may not understand it, He will turn it into good for us. Everybody say good. The Bible said everything works together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. It didn't say that everything that happens is good. But God has a unique way of when the devil is trying to destroy something, God's got a way of being able to come back in behind and say, now let me show you what I do. Father, I thank you for it. Thank you, Jesus. and you don't have family, come up here and stand with me because we all family here. Come on up here. Come on up here. You might Come stand with me if you don't have any family here today. How many of you know that God's a healer? Amen. 
we're going to, I, I want you to stretch your hands toward our sister today. And we're going to pray God's healing touch over her leg. She took a bad fall and it's messed this leg up. God can straighten out what's been messed up. Amen. Just stretch your hands to heaven. Father, I thank you for it even now. Lord, I declare your word over her life. By your stripes, we were healed. We lay claim to that now. You've promised that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish that that it was set forth to do. Father, we've engaged your word. Now, let it work. <laughs> I praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As you're holding your, as, as you're hugging family, I want you just to squeeze them in tight and say this to each other say this to each other I'm thankful for the journey that brought us together I'm thankful that he's always there and he loves us and he's going to keep us no matter what happens we have a reason to rejoice. Amen. God bless you. Come on, let's give him a hand clap of praise today. We love you. Have a happy Thanksgiving.